Our next speaker is a UC Berkeley representative, Go Bears. That's where I hail from. Trevor Darrell is on the faculty of the UC Berkeley EECS department and leads the computer vision group at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley. Um, before that, from 1999 to 2008, he served on the faculty at MIT in the EECS department, where he led the CSAIL Vision Interfaces group. Uh, since he joined us at Cal, well, them at Cal, I don't, yeah. Uh, he's been working in the areas of visual perception, machine learning, multimodal interfaces, uh, and he's also doing some entrepreneurial activity in Berkeley on the side. Uh, please help me welcome Trevor Darrell. The most productive results in the last month. This is my one-month-old daughter and her older brother. So that's been uh, her name is Linnea. So that's been our uh, our happiness at home. And I think today I'd like to be uh, maybe a bit of the reconciler after this 3D versus 2D debate that we've seen unfold and tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing at Berkeley and our perspective on uh, using machine learning to really bridge the gap between uh, the sort of robotic vision perspective that we've heard and some of the more traditional computer vision perspective. So one thing to say is even though we have seen a lot of progress in computer vision, there's still a long way to go. I don't think we're close yet to having broad category level recognition, even in relatively simple indoor environments. Or maybe we're close. It may only be a year or two away, but it's, it still can require some significant advances. And maybe it'll come from bridging the gaps that we've seen here today. right? So uh, it's almost a bit of a setup, what, what was just uh, uh, the discussion we just had, which is nice. Because I do think there are divergent perspectives uh, in terms of how Vision people traditionally would see these problems, and robotics people would see these problems. So what's the vision perspective? Well, at least from the, from the morning, it's uh, really a machine learning philosophy. Uh, and that can often be boiled down to who has the largest data set wins, right? <laughs> I mean, algorithms matter, but data really does matter. Um, there's a downside of that, uh, and we see in the flip side when we look at how roboticists approach the problem. It leads to the least common denominator in terms of the uh, features that one uses. You don't really know what color means on the web, so you're probably not going to use it. There's not a lot of 3D data on the web yet, so we're probably not going to use it. But there's a lot of data, and we can learn categories, but with weak features. What's the robotic point of view? Well, it's a sensing paradigm. Sensors are cheap. They're getting cheaper. Why not just throw multi-spectral imaging, uh, four different connects, uh, have everything on there, 3D models, it's great. Whoever has the most sensors win, right? Uh, well, it's sort of there's a, the flip side of that coin. If, with so many sensors, you really can only get training data in the particular environment that you're, you built your rig. It's very hard to generalize, at least with conventional methods. So we have strong features, but really uh, an instance recognition focus so far. So where do we go from here? So which one is right? I'd like a show of hands. So how many people go for computer vision? How many people go for robotic vision? Well, no one wants to commit here, which is probably the right answer. Uh, neither one is entirely right. Both are probably right. And the philosophy that I'd like to advocate really combines many of the different themes we've seen today, which, including a machine learning foundation, which is let's learn to use both of them. Right? We're really not going to simply adopt a 3D paradigm or a 2D paradigm. And so here are the kinds of um, uh, what I mean by that. Right? We'd like to learn how to leverage robotic and vision perspectives together. For example, uh, detect, uh, develop rich uh, low-level features uh, that can handle the kind of complicated sensing that happens in the real world. Uh, exploit machine learning to learn mappings between modalities. So we may have a certain set of modalities at training time and a different set of modalities at test time, and still, without any manual tuning or engineering, uh, get something done. Um, and uh, finally, learn the shift between domains. We may be uh, uh, trying to run a robot in this environment, recognizing objects that are found on the fly, but using training data from a, a, an environment completely external to this environment with different types of imaging conditions and, uh, and whatnot, and we'd like to um, do better than a naive approach would at that. So there's a sampling of different projects that I could tell you about today, ranging from 
uh, including hallucination and learning uh, these uh, 2.1D representations. I'm not really going to have time to talk about those two, and I'm instead going to focus on these three. The first is learning uh, low and mid-level features using a sort of a hierarchical probabilistic sparse coding, really actually echoing many of the themes that Andrew presented uh, earlier today. Uh, then I'll talk about our work on domain adaptation, uh, how we learn in one domain and test in another. And then I'll briefly uh, also sing the praises of the Connect and related 3D sensors and uh, mention our effort to collect a new data set for 3D category recognition. So let's dive right in. So the, uh, first let me tell you about this work, which is a probabilistic model for recursive uh, factorized image features. This is a CVPR 11 paper by Sergei Karyev, Mario Fritz, Sonia Fiedler, and myself. Uh, and it actually follows much of the same philosophy that we saw this morning. So I really can, I can go on both sides here. I can, I can tell the Will Garage story, or I can tell the it's all just uh, you know, semi-supervised learning or, 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 uh, or sparse coding story. Uh, we'd like to have a distributed coding of local image features, uh, especially the kinds of representations that are useful for, for vision. Historically, they've been uh, coded using relatively naive vector quantization um, approaches to find these visual words. And as we saw this morning, approaches based on additive models, especially sparse coding, have been uh, quite successful. Uh, we've also looked at this ourselves in terms of a probabilistic topic model approach to uh, an additive decomposition of, uh, for example, SIF descriptors. So you can see how you might take a local descriptor and factor it into constituent parts that might capture the fact that there's multiple different things happening locally in, a, in, a, in an image or in an image patch. So, so we're also on this bandwagon of hierarchical models. Hierarchies are very important. I think everyone had a slide like this today. It's interesting. Uh, you didn't have one in the Willow, in the Willow talk, but you... you yeah, good. So it it's probably not, doesn't require much motivation to, to say that hierarchies have uh, a strong inspiration from biology, that if you look at psychophysics, there must be top-down influences in perception. And so we'd like, uh, and also that hierarchies enable effective sharing of visual features, uh, and that there's been a long tradition of models in computational neuroscience and computer vision that have chipped away at this idea of learning a representation and learning it in a hierarchical fashion. But one limitation, and I won't have time to go into all of these um, models, one uh, limitation of, the, of many of the existing methods is that they do so only in a feed-forward fashion. They learn, uh, they approach learning and inference only from the bottom up. So if you have a representation here where you've, I apologize if you can't see my pointer, where you learn a uh, set of sparse codes, or in our case, probabilistic topic model over uh, image patches, and then you go to then explore a hierarchy of that or a recursion on this representation, where you take the stacked output of those activations and use them as inputs in another layer. Well, first you, you learn a representation for the first layer, and then you attack the entire problem again and learn a representation for the second layer. <laughs> Instead, what we've explored in our recent work is what's the, what is the benefit of uh, jointly optimizing across uh, the hierarchy so that you, you don't, in fact, rely on a fixed representation from, um, uh, from the bottom layer when you're learning the top layer, but you can optimize all aspects of the representation jointly. So this is our, uh, our goal and our result in, in our recent uh, CVPR 11 paper, a distributed coding of local features in a hierarchical model that allows full inference um, and full recursion. So we derive our method based on probabilistic topic models using uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, and we call it um, alternately recursive LDA or sometimes hierarchical LDA. Uh, so I won't go into this in detail. I, many of you have seen these models before. They've been used in vision in uh, many places over the years. Most famously, they're used to describe topics which are composed of quantized uh, SIF descriptors or visual words. And that's not how we're using it here. We're actually, build, we're actually building topics over the descriptor itself, not topics over quantized descriptors. So we have a representation, for example, of SIFT, 
and we form topics over the individual cells in the, uh, in the gradient histogram. So our topics can be, <coughs> excuse me, our topics can be thought of as uh, finding structures that are additively combined or transparently combined. And we can find uh, uh, um, Visualization. So we can find these topics, which are similar to what we've seen before in sparse coding, but now they're uh, evaluated over local SIF descriptors, or they're forming the constituent um, um, bases of, of, of histogram-based descriptors. And here, uh, here's a visualization of average images that might give rise, give rise to each topic. So our baseline is just the feedforward method. Uh, we can express here an instance of the recursive model in its full glory. Uh, and here's a visualization of how you might jointly be estimating um, uh, topics over a patch and then topics on top, on top of topics for a patch. Uh, we've approached this with a Gibbs sampler for inference and uh, do use a few uh, schemes for efficient initialization. Uh, and so far in uh, our, our tests, we're able to show that th this recursive model that jointly optimizes both layers, and we'll go beyond two layers eventually, but so far that's what we've explored, is better than just feed-forward initialization, and it's better than just a single flat model even when you control for dimensionality. And it compares very favorably to all the other published hierarchical models, I think beating all that we've uh, considered to date, and still does very well compared to even the best of the best, such as the work that uh, Kai and others have shown earlier today, and the um, saliency methods from UCSD. So these are the kinds of visualizations we get. So the, f the first part of the story is how we can learn good models from the bottom up. We can learn them in a hierarchical fashion from data. And um, when we, f we, we find that when we do so, we get better performance jointly optimizing the representation rather than just doing a feed forward. <laughs> Um, and there are many different future directions we're considering, including um, pushing the hierarchy all the way up to the object level, looking at a spatiotemporal volume, um, and uh, training it discriminatively and considering non-parametric models. Can you still hear me if I walk away from the podium? Oh, good. Good. So the other, um, okay, so that was the first, the first theme today. The second theme is domain adaptation which is what happens when you uh, train on one thing, but you test on another. What you see is not always what you get in vision. And this is the work of Kate Senko and Brian Kulis, who are postdocs in my lab, uh, also with Mario Fritz. Uh, and Kate is jointly appointed at Harvard and at Berkeley. Now, that's a commute. So, <laughs> so people are very good at a wide range of visual category problems. How do you can recognize these uh, mice in many different domains. Uh, even if I show you examples of Mickey Mouse, you could then find the matching mouse in uh, a real image. But, hum uh, but machines often suffer even with very simple transformations. So even if you just go from one type of image sensor to another image sensor, you can uh, find yourself in a very different feature space. Uh, and you can also find very different domains just by looking at, at objects at different scales or in different poses, illuminations or backgrounds, um, or when you're moving from one domain which is more artistic to another domain which is more uh, surveillance, for example, uh, or seasons. So we'd like to overcome this problem of training in one domain and testing in another domain. So in most object recognition paradigms, we assume that we have essentially the same distribution of training data and testing data. So we assume that we have a lot of labeled data, and we get um, you know, a nice image uh, of, of some instance. And we just go back and compare what does this look like using some fancy machine learning algorithm, and that's fine. This is what most all of existing computer vision research has been exploring recently. But in the real world, you go out to take a picture of this cup, which is taken in a completely different domain. Ah, the temperature just changed about 10 degrees from here to here. <laughs> I apologize for the video, which will now suffer as I stand over here. Um, 
So, so we'd like to be able to recognize the cup on the bottom, which is taken from a completely different domain. And the sad truth is the existing methods don't work uh, right out of the box. In fact, if you just try and train on one domain, such as um, objects in an office, but train on images that were collected outside of that domain, such as Amazon or the web, uh, you know, if you train on Amazon and test on Amazon, life is pretty good. But if you then try and train on webcam images, uh, all hell breaks loose and you lose anything close to good performance. So what's the solution to this? Well, one solution is just to ask everyone to label everything in every environment. That's, that's uh, maybe the conventional approach. Um, but it's awfully uh, imposing, and that's not what we'd like to do. It's too expensive, even with Mechanical Turk. You could try and engineer features such that in that feature space, everything is invariant to everything that could go wrong. And that's actually probably the conventional approach. If you think of how, what the representations we use today, in fact, do, they've been hand-engineered to try and be invariant to illumination and, and the kinds of pose variation that don't seem to matter. But they don't seem to solve the whole problem. So there's obviously some part of the problem that we can't hand-engineer, and we should probably turn to machine learning to solve that part of the problem. So that's our idea. <laughs> try and learn some notion of domain shift from, from the data. Right? So here we have an example where we have instances of different categories uh, in different domains. For example, here are three different categories, but they're in different domains. So for example, I have uh, circles, both taken in the green domain and in the blue domain, and squares in the blue domain and squares in the green domain, and, uh, and, and stars. And here for the stars, maybe I actually have labeled data in both domains. Or rather, for stars, I have no labeled data in both domains. But for the others, I do. So I can, I can actually give, I can do something with the stars. I can take advantage of the fact that I know that, that, these star, that the circles and the squares had corresponding elements. So I know that, that there were squares over here in the blue domain and over here in the green domain, and circles over here in the, red, in the um, green domain and over here in the blue domain. So it looks like there's some sort of domain shift that's going on in this space. And much as I can optimize representations for specific categories, here I can optimize a representation for a specific domain shift. So I know I don't really want to change things in this direction, but it does seem like changing things in this direction is useful for this, for whatever transformation is happening between feature spaces between these two domains. And so that's the crux of our idea. We'd like to have a, uh, some sort of feature space transformation that maps from a raw domain to a domain in which, um, to, or to a, from a raw space to a space in which domain shift is minimized. So we can frame this as a transformation learning problem, given uh, pairs of similar examples, much like in traditional metric learning, we can say, let's uh, find a transformation of a space such that the distance between examples that are in fact the same, but in different domains, is, uh, is small using our learned representation. But with a raw representation, it would be large. So how do we learn W? Well, this is where we put our machine learning hats on and take advantage of uh, a variety of, of interesting approaches that have been applied for metric learning and other forms of transformation learning. Uh, the work of Bengio uh, here at Google has inspired us in the past. Um, but to our knowledge, none, no one had really applied this for domain transformation, uh, where you try and solve an, op an optimization problem that uh, balances a regularization against uh, constraints formed from those similarity uh, um, links. So there's two ways you can think of forming these constraints. One is based on category, where you say, these, uh, these are two cups, so I'm going to form these, uh, these links between these cups. These are not cups. This is a, a cleaner. So uh, the important thing is that you don't, if you're going to do a learner domain transformation, you actually don't want to do the traditional metric learning thing, which is to have uh, intra-class similarity constraints and, uh, and dissimilarity constraints across different classes. Here, we only want to learn the domain shift. We actually don't want to learn anything uh, re related to a specific class. 
So that's much of the art of this um, idea is in how you form those constraints. You can also form them uh, across instances if you happen to know that this is exactly the same corresponding object. That's the best, the best case for this domain shift idea. OK, so uh, and there are ways to learn these transformations efficiently, even with a kernelized um, or a kernelized version of these transformations. And um, we've both looked at a, uh, a symmetric transformations. And most that was an ECCV paper. And our CVPR paper is uh, the asymmetric case. So there are, is a stream of related work in domain transformation, do, uh, modeling domain shift, especially uh, in the um, natural language and uh, um, um, and text processing communities, some of which have been applied to vision. Uh, there, and there's a, there are sort of classic techniques that look at pre-processing the data, um, how you can um, create domain and uh, sor uh, source and domain specific versions. There are ways that adapt SVM parameters for, uh, for video uh, transformation. Uh, and there are also ways to model um, um, uh, match, uh, readjust the training data to match the, the test data distribution. None of these can handle the specific case that we were looking at, which is when you have training data for some number of categories, but a category for, uh, in both domains, but you have a new category where you have no, no training data at all. So I come into this room. I want to recognize these chairs. I have no label data for this chair. But I do have label data for a few other objects that may both be uh, on the web and be in this domain. And I use that to learn a transformation that can then help me uh, learn these chairs. So we've done some work uh, evaluating this on a data set that we collected for uh, domain transformation. So the uh, here, for example, are is a category of keyboard that we collected from Amazon, a uh, high resolution camera, and a low resolution camera. We've shown how the um, methods we've developed improve over various baselines. We've also shown that the asymmetric method improves over the symmetric method. And we have a few really egregious examples, which are you know somewhat unfair, which are that if you take completely different feature spaces, uh, baseline techniques will give you garbage. So if you simply change the level of quantization in a normal um, visual word model and then try and do nearest neighbors, of course, you find garbage. You find that this um, pad matches these, all these other different types of uh, objects. But our method can easily learn that uh, transformation. And um, I mean, you, could, you could engineer that transformation as well, but you can also learn it directly. OK, so we're excited about this idea of domain transformation. <clears throat> <clears throat> we think it's an important one in computer vision, and we've um, shown a variety of cool things. OK. Any questions about this so far? So last but not least, I want to go and uh, you know, throw my hat back in with the 3D uh, uh, folks and say that I think there is, uh, the time is ripe again to, to really take a serious look at 3D for many uh, of the vision problems that recently had been tackled mostly with 2D. Um, and, and looking back at my original slides, the reason, or the first slides that I presented um, at the beginning of the talk, the reason I think vision uh, researchers looked at 2D features is they wanted category level variation and wanted to look at things that could be found from the web. Uh, and so then, uh, uh, if you're going to match images from the web, you really have to rely on some of the techniques that were developed for wide baseline matching and, and uh, not really um, 3D object uh, descriptors. But the, and every several years, there's a new revolutionary 3D sensor. right? I think we, those of us who've been in the community for quite a while can remember these. There are um, uh, real-time stereo hardware is still exciting. Uh, my friends at the Tizix uh, company are, are are, uh, continue to pioneer in that uh, realm. The time of flight sensors that came out uh, three or four or five years ago. Uh, LIDAR, uh, you know, sort of the success of uh, robotic vision made everyone think that a LIDAR sensor was going to be the, the uh, 
impressive thing uh, until recently. But now the Connect has come on the scene and provides images that really do have a, a quality and, um, I guess, ubiquity that seems quite exciting. And so we think the time is right now to attack category-level vision, the kind of vision challenges that we've seen in Pascal um, and um, Caltech 101 and so on and so forth, uh, in contrast to instance-based challenges uh, using this type of sensor. We looked in the literature and we couldn't find many existing, uh, <coughs> many existing 3D category-level um, data sets. They all had limited scene, limited, uh, limited scene complexity, limited number of categories, limited pose variation, uh, and, and many had just explicitly an instance focus. So we've uh, begun a collection effort that will be um, open source to the community in the, in the spirit of the Label Me data set that has uh, complicated uh, real world scenes where we've collected registered uh, depth and uh, intensity data. Here's an example of the size distribution of categories that we have. Uh, here's an, here are some samples from the chair category. So you can see there's just a lot of, the Connect does give you a lot of uh, signal there. And I think the vision community had avoided uh, uh, tackling the problem of category level representations with, with explicit 3D descriptors. And now's the time to uh, come back and, and get to it. Uh, one of the most obvious things when you look at 3D data is the distribution of uh, size priors. So if you compare the distribution of categories in 2D in a scene, and you can, and of course, you get a huge range of variation. If you look at the 3D variation, it's in many cases much tighter. So that's the first thing that one can exploit with 3D. Uh, and um, the other obvious thing one can do that, that several groups had proposed uh, recently is to directly use a uh, orientation histogram descriptor on a depth signal. And so we've considered both of these as baseline uh, methods on this data set. And it's a mixed bag. I think the simple things are not necessarily going to immediately uh, be what wins. Surprisingly, even with this really beautiful, clean data, quote unquote, you have problems. There are so monitors, uh, glasses. They still don't necessarily show up and connect. Flat objects, still you may not find a connect signature. So if you just use depth alone, you're not going to have necessarily a signature from those objects. Um, but you can often improve um, uh, the search complexity by pruning. So this is a project we've just started and are interested in collaborating with other groups who are Connect hackers. Uh, so please contact us if you'd like to join forces. OK, so those are the three themes that I wanted to talk about today, how to uh, take a hierarchical um, uh, approach to learning low-level and mid-level image features, how to learn transformations between domains so you can train in one environment and test in another, and our first look at 3D category level recognition. I think we're going to see an evolution of visual object recognition re research move towards 3D and robotics domains uh, where you have uh, the whole problem being considered at the same time, including interaction with people. I think uh, having a, a PR2 that can recognize everything in the environment and, and uh, have a conversation with a person uh, about the objects is really an exciting topic. I didn't have time to mention any of the ideas we have on how, you, how language and vision might um, work together, but that is one for the future. And so I'd like to end with just some of these themes that I think are important for the, for the coming year and coming years, how we can effectively bridge category level and instance level learning, uh, fully integrate the, the richness of scene and task content, context that the, um, these robotic domains are going to provide us, uh, and expl <clears throat> explicitly model user interaction and leverage uh, data from multiple sources. But I put in a plug for two things that really do work right now. These are two local companies that are looking at optimal fusion of crowdsourcing and computer vision in the case of IQ engines. And in uh, an old interest of mine that I think is coming back now with Connect, how you use vision for interface in, um, in gestures that can control 
um, lightweight user interfaces. And I do um, advise both of these companies, so it's a bit of a plug. So I'd like to thank everyone who helped with these projects, including uh, my students and postdocs who are listed here. And they deserve all the credit, and I'll take all of the criticism. Thanks very much. They're fast. <laughs> so we have lots of time for questions still um, before the refreshments yeah, I arrive. I slides thinking that I've gone through too much, <laughs> but I could put them back in. But they all have equations on them, so <laughs> you, might, you might prefer to just ask me a few questions. Well, I think we used transparency for our early work in additive probabilistic models because we thought it was a fun and entertaining example. But it's certainly not true that all objects are transparent. But it is true that these additive models are useful for, for general objects. And that's what the results that we showed, uh, that I showed earlier, confirmed for just Caltech 101 or, or any kind of object. And, you can add, and, and also it's similar to what Andrew and others and, and, and Caillou have shown with sparse coding that even for non-transparent objects, objects that you think of as being traditionally um, a single process, often aren't, perhaps because of background effects or, or occlusion effects, or because of unmodeled um, illumination effects, even for uh, non-transparent objects. So I think this, the, the set of objects that are truly modeled by sort of a constant albedo patch that's you know, hom homogeneous within a rectangle it's pretty small. I should have repeated the question. Why, yeah, the question was, why, you could figure out the answer, the question from the answer, right? <laughs> this is Jeopardy for you all. Uh, one of you guys, I don't know who, which is first. So, so in your first uh, part of the work, um, so uh, you built up this hierarchical model, right? And uh, since you're already working on learning the hierarchical uh, filtering, uh, simultaneously, so why don't you uh, directly working from the pixels? So let's say learn everything from the pixels. That would be cool, right? Yeah, that would be cool, and I think that's uh, th although that is what many people already had done. So we wanted to, to sort of uh, attack part of the space that had not yet really been addressed, which is applying these probabilistic topic models or sparse coding models directly to SIFT and seeing what, what, what we could get out of that. But time permitting, uh, I think we would like to go back and have a model that um, was both, which, in which the different layers were tuned to the different underlying noise models of the raw pixels. And you should be able to get the whole thing out of a three-layer three, top, a three -layer model. But. So when you, when you, uh, when, when you did learn your uh, domain transformation matrix W. Uh, do you actually need to put in feature correspondences? Or, and, and if you don't, why not? We don't put in feature correspondences. We do put, on, put in instance correspondences. So we say here, given a particular feature representation, let's say we're just doing a traditional bag of words model at this point. Here's, here's what a cup looks like in my particular representation. And here's what the same cup looks like in a different domain. Uh, or even just, here are cups in one domain, and here are cups in another domain. So we're learning a transformation on the entire feature space, not per individual feature as you were thinking of them. Any other questions? Sure. So uh, at the very beginning, you mentioned uh, uh, in the training time, you probably can use a multi-modality of signals. And uh, then in the test time, maybe some of the modalities are missing, right? So, uh, but uh, somehow in, in your following work, you didn't uh, particularly mention or uh, this particular part. Yeah. Talk, I can give. <laughs> well, that was one of the, the, the topics that I didn't cover today in the, in, in the interest of time. Um, where we do, and this was a CVPR 10 paper we had, where we do 
hallucinate modalities, uh, in, in essence, if you have a certain set of modalities that are uh, present in your test data but not present in your um, training data, you can essentially apply semi-supervised learning, learn a model that maps from one modality to another from this pile of unlabeled data that you have at test time. And, it, you know, it's counterintuitive, but it actually helps if you go back and hallucinate more training data, at least it helped in our experiments, and use that to build um, a model. There, uh, I'm not sure we've... Um, I think there are a variety of ways one can approach that problem, and we approached it from a supervised uh, learning regression problem, a, a paradigm using Gaussian processes, but there are other, uh, there are other approaches. I haven't, uh, and um, that's a topic that many folks have uh, investigated in vision in the, in the, in the last few years. Um, and, and I think often it's frustrating that it's hard to build good co-occurrence models at the level of visual words. Certainly, there have been recent efforts that have started to show success, and I, I think Fei-Fei, if she's still in the room, has a model that does touch on that. So I might defer to her or anyone else, but I haven't done it. and. Um, and I don't have a good summary of the recent literature. Does it work? Didn't you do co <laughs> feature co-occurrences in a topic model? Um, there are many ways to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any last questions? With that, maybe we should return some time to the to those of us who have to drive back to Berkeley. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>